Welcome everyone to this episode of Manufacturing Talk Radio. I'm Tim Grady. I'm here with Lou Weiss, who's the founder of Manufacturing Talk Radio. He is also the president of All Metals and Forge Group, a manufacturer of open die forgings and seamless roll rings. And while Lou and I were at a Fabtech conference one year, we ran into a gentleman who has a worldly knowledge of economics, Dr. Chris Keel, and he joins us again today for his flagship report. Thanks for being with us, Chris. Yep, and, and you always forget to mention that when you ran into me, you knocked me down, and then we started a great friendship, and, and <laughs> there we've been ever since. So. so it appears that the chickens have come home to roost. The ISM report has softened into what they still call expanding territory, but let's say it's below 50. All the indexes instead of, I'm sorry, except employment are below 50. So it's softened. We expected it. Here it is. Yes, it has. And, but it's, I think it's critical that you use the term softened because we're still kind of within shouting distance of, of normal. And the trouble with indices is that they always feel so, so firm. You know, it's like we have numbers. It's like it's 53, it's 46, and we know. But there's always a little bit of, of wiggle room in, in all of this because it is a survey and you're responding to how people perceive their situation. You know, we've worked with surveys at Armada for years and some of them are a lot more responsive to the future than they are to current situations or they tend to be lagging where you end up with a response to what was as opposed to what is. So right now we're kind of in that netherworld where it can be really bad for some sectors. It can be fairly promising for others. And then a lot of those are kind of in the wait and see mode where it's like, well, it could be worse. It could be better, um, but it's, it's survivable. And I think what we're starting to see is a little bit of I don't know, light at the end of the tunnel, a lot of conversation in the last week or so has been around inflation. And you just saw a bunch of data come out of Europe that reflects what we've been seeing in the United States, that inflation is coming down, but not by a lot. I mean, the Europeans were very excited because the euro inflation was down to 9.2, which is the first time in two or three months it's been below double digits. And everybody was like, yay, inflation's going, it's like it's 9.2. It hasn't gone down much, but it is trending in the right direction. And so the sense is, is that we may have hit the peak of the bad news. We haven't really started seeing good news yet, but we may have seen the worst as, as far as recession threats and inflation and now we can start thinking well okay now that we've hit peak when do things get better and a lot of conversation between optimists and pessimists who are saying yeah, it's going to get better by second quarter and then the pessimists are like yeah what have you been smoking um it's going to be the end of the year before we see any real improvement so Right now, there's something for everybody. You've got some glass half full and some glass half empty. <clears throat> and we've talked about this before. My engineer father always used to say, it's neither half full nor half empty. You have the wrong vessel for the amount of liquids on hand. <laughs> Get a smaller vessel, it'll fill right up. <laughs> exactly. So Chris, uh, let's kind of walk around. You talked about Europe a little bit. Everybody's kind of curious about Asia. China seems to be having some difficulties. Where are they having difficulties other than everywhere in their economy? Yeah, exactly. Well, we've been dealing with the supply chain issue all year, at least two years, really. <clears throat> and it's been laid in the lap of China. It's just that it's being motivated by different crises. At the beginning of the year, it was all about zero tolerance and the lockdown. And China just wasn't producing because it had literally shut its economy down trying to deal with COVID. That was a monumental economic mistake. Um, 
hard to tell what it did from a health perspective yet. <clears throat> but they ended up saying, this is ridiculous. It's destroying our economy. We have to move out of lockdown, which they did. And everyone said, yay, the supply chain is now going to fix itself. Unfortunately, what removing those lockdowns meant was that your previously somewhat protected population was no longer protected. And China has been dealing with literally millions and millions of cases of COVID because they haven't had the experience that the US and Europe has had where we kind of removed the restrictions and stages and we built up a certain amount of herd immunity. We can go on for days about that, but China had none of that. Now, all of a sudden, they're like, okay, we're back to production, except that none of the workers are showing up because they're all sick. And so, and if we are producing, <clears throat> we're producing and responding to so much demand that we're being overwhelmed and we still can't ship. And so the world is saying, you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Your supply chain was shattered by the lockdown. Now it's being shattered by the absence of the lockdown. So you're just a mess either way. And, and China is like, shut up. Um, <laughs> it's like, we thought we had this all figured out. Well, you didn't. And the world is still trying to move away uh, from, from China, but it's going to be slow. I mean, we, we still import 70, 80 billion dollars from China, you know, on a monthly basis. And it's going to be a long haul moving away from China as a supplier. One last comment to make, and it's just <clears throat> something we know but forget, it isn't like we do business with China. You know, it's not like we're cutting a deal with Xi personally. There's some Chinese company in Shanghai who is interested in making money. And so, you know, Mr. Wu in Shanghai is like, I want to sell you something. Good, we'd like to buy it from you. He goes, I don't care what the government says. I don't care what your government says. Do you want to buy what I have to sell? And there are literally tens of thousands of these negotiations and interactions taking place every day. And they're quite separate from big governmental decisions you know you've got you know mr wu saying if i can find a way to ship this to you by golly i'm gonna um because that's what i do for a living i make i was talking to a guy the other day that he has works with a company out of shenzhen that makes christmas lights and it's like you know i just make christmas lights i want to sell at a certain time of year, if you catch my drift, um, we don't sell a lot of those in June. <laughs> but, so. yeah, right. The number that I heard, uh, Chris, was 7 million new cases of COVID in China a day. Yep. 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 And they're dealing with the same kind. I and mean, this is part of the confusion around the world. They're dealing a lot with the kind of new COVID which is incredibly easy to get, but it's also the kind of COVID that, you know, makes you sick for a few days and you go back to work. I mean, I've got at least five people I know that got COVID at the beginning of the week and they're fine now. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's behaving like flu. The problem is, is not as it was at the beginning of the year where people were being, and there still are many people being hospitalized, but it's, it's the kind of problem that, that you deal with when your entire workforce gets the flu at the same time. And it's like, well, they're all going to be back to work next week or the week after. But in the meantime, we're shut down. And, and if that shutdown actually has been affects the ports and affects the ships and it affects the transportation internally, you know, it's just a massive disruption that is eventually coming to an end, but the key is eventually. And it's been difficult for U.S. companies, European companies to figure out, where are we? Are we going to get this stuff or not? Um, and if we can't get it from China, who do we get it from? 
And if we're going to start making it in the U.S., well, when does that happen? I mean, everybody I talk to is like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm ready to switch to who, you know, who's going to be my new supplier. And Mr. Wu is the guy who's standing in the back going, I can still be your supplier. Give me a couple weeks. So. I'd like to go back to uh, the beginning of uh, our show where we were talking about inflation. <clears throat> you did a good job in explaining uh, the optimist and the non-optimist. And is it going to be a hard landing? Is it going to be a soft landing? Is it going to be a long landing? Is it going to be second quarter, third quarter, fifth quarter of next, of next year, 2024? I didn't hear your opinion. Where do yeah. you think it's going? Exactly. In the first place, I love the idea of a fifth quarter. Um, you know, it's like, <laughs> I, I would have, I would have really enjoyed that flexibility in my math class. It's like, you know, how many, how many quarters and, you know, like six, 12, I don't know. Um, but I'm becoming more and more convinced. I always was sort of convinced that we were heading for a fairly short, fairly shallow downturn and that inflation would begin to ease within a pretty reasonable length of time. And if you look at what's been driving the inflation numbers down, Europe was pretty explicit about it in this last report. It's been energy. What drove it so hard at the beginning of the year was energy. We had the sanctions and all that kind of stuff and the price of fuel went out of orbit. And now you've seen dramatic drops. The per barrel price is down, the gallon price is down, even diesel is down. That's largely what has allowed inflation to to peak. The only worrying thing to me, because I still I still see that trend continuing. Oil prices staying down, commodities in general starting to come down, shipping rates coming down, all that kind of stuff. What bothers me and concerns me is wages. And we've seen wage inflation become the dominant inflation in the last six months, seven months. And two things about wage inflation. Number one, once it goes up, it doesn't come down very easily. The only way that the wages come back down is layoffs. So it's not like you can give people a raise and say, yep, sorry, things have changed. I'm taking your raise back. It's like, I know I was paying you $20 an hour. I don't want to anymore. I'm going to pay you 12. And you know that's when all your workers join your machines, walk out, attack your car you know they're not happy the only way that you reduce their wages is fire them and given the worker shortage that's not likely so the other thing about wages is that they tend to be fairly rapid um, when they do start to go up because the worker and you know the pattern, you started to have to pay the entry level worker a higher wage to get them. Well, everybody else that works for you looks at that and says, hey, you're paying the new guy $15, $20 an hour. That's what you used to pay me. And I'm not new. I'm the experienced guy. You need to pay me 30. And then the guy who was making 30 goes, wait a minute. I know more than that joker. And I used to make, you need to make me, you know, so all of a sudden everybody's wage goes up and, and it goes up relatively quickly, particularly when workers have leverage, which they do now. Um, it's, you know, the worker shortage has been going on for a long time. I could go into a full on rant about this um, because <laughs> our, our good men and women of Congress who are diligently fighting over absolutely nothing. It's like, how can you look me in the eye with a straight face and say, you didn't know this was coming? It's chronological. When people were 64 last year, it's amazing. They'll be 65 this year. That's how it works. By 2030, all of the boomers will have breached retirement age, all of them, 74 million people. Did you not notice that they were going to be leaving the workforce? That's why we need to have 
a different kind of immigration policy. Oh, yes, absolutely. Particularly bring over all the Ukrainians who are skilled workers and give them open arms, give them a place to live, give them food, give them food stamps, do whatever you got to do, but get they've got millions that could come yeah. here and walk into a job tomorrow. And and beyond that, it would be really useful if if the powers that be would take a look at our own population and say, you know, at some point we really ought to think about seriously training our own population. You know that you know how have we gotten to a point where five percent of high schools in the United States still have industrial arts? Five percent. I mean, when I was going to, and man, admittedly, I was going to school in the 1400s. I mean, it's been a while, but I remember in high school that at noon, half the school disappeared because they were all in Bowtech programs and they're all going out and starting their jobs and careers. I went to a very working class high school. We were not expected to go to college. We were expecting to go to work for some company in the area. And, you know, I talked to these people that I knew in high school, guess what? They're still gainfully employed in those industries that they went into. And now we just kind of fiddle away and throw them into college and whether they need to be in college or not. And back when I was a professor, I realized that 25% of the workforce is a kinetic learner. They learn with their hands. And there's no worse way to educate a kinetic learner than to stand up in front of them and blather at them for an hour, the sage on the stage. I mean, it's just, you could look at their faces. It was Charlie Brown's parents. Wah, 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 wah. They're like, can I learn something useful where I can make a living? like no 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 you have to get a college degree in underwater pottery basket weaving well as you know chris we don't really talk politics on our oh never show. never we just <laughs> however however if we could get past the vote of 12 today or yes. 13 or 15 and get the house of representatives working maybe we can come up with solutions that would start to fix things. But again, I am not talking politics. I just want to make that clear. Yeah, the unfortunate thing, and I think this has been a reality for probably 10, 15 years, expecting much out of the federal government is, is kind of a losing proposition because what Congress has deteriorated into is kind of an arguing platform um, where the vast majority of the people who get elected don't really have a goal in mind except to rant and rave and scream at each other. Most of the really good work that I've been watching for the last 10 years has happened at the state and local level. And particularly when you start getting into things like training and educating, that's going to be a state and local responsibility. So the encouraging thing is then states that focus on workforce development, that focus on infrastructure, where you start to get school districts saying, well, we really need to think about what we are teaching our kids. We really need to think about their futures. And if we're in a neighborhood, a region that is largely working class, why aren't we preparing our students for those jobs? And, you know, I live in Kansas City, and Kansas City is kind of a a working class city in a lot of respects. The most interesting work is being done by some of the high schools and the community colleges here, where you've got really good programs putting people into really good jobs. I mean, there's a community college here that trains people to be linemen. And it it is currently the fastest route in Kansas to a six-figure income is to be a lineman. The day that you're hired, you will be making over $100,000 a year. And there's generally a signing bonus of 30, 40,000 bucks. Now, you're going to have to be climbing a pole in Kansas in January, you know, so it isn't like the world's most 
pleasant job, but hey, you know, it's it's job security as long as you're not afraid of heights. Or electricity. Yeah. Or electricity <laughs> or, or, or freezing rain. cold weather. Um, exactly. So, you know, not not uh, it was an incentive for me earlier to to be an economist to realize that, you know, there's no heavy lifting in my profession. So well, Chris, you were talking about the educational system not turning out students who are able to go into the workforce because they lack industrial skills. They're actually not turning out students who can read, write, uh, speak clearly. Um, yeah, ex exactly, exactly. I mean, yeah, we've we've got we've got we've got some pretty good sized issues to to contend with but you know back to to Lou's point about immigration we really have not thought about who we want and and why we want them in our country but other countries do and so he's talking about you know the ukrainians that are seeking a new life i mean in the beginning there was the understanding at that you know maybe this wouldn't last very long and they could go home but i've i've spoken to people who are in the refugee community and they're like well there's no home to go home to it's been destroyed and we're facing the fact that we're going to have to reestablish ourselves and if you look at the germans and the french and the poles they're all very actively welcoming in and integrating in Ukrainians. And, you know, we have not done a great job of that, but we don't do a great job of integrating the people from Latin America. You know, we definitely have those who are unskilled that we're not sure what to do with, but we also have a lot of skilled workers in places like Brazil and Mexico and Colombia who are like, well, we'd be interested in coming if you seemed like you wanted us but you don't and therefore we're not interested i mean when spain does a better job of recruiting skilled workers from mexico than we do that's not a good sign no doubt <laughs> well chris we've uh, enjoyed having you with us again we are uh, operating our show on a little tighter time frame because we're syndicating across AM and FM, so we're very That's excited. Very good. And we appreciate you being with us and sharing information on what's going on in the economy. Thank you very much. You're welcome very much, and good luck with the syndication. It sounds, you know, almost, almost, you know, mafia-like, which is great, you know, so we have a syndicate. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris, and a happy new year to you. Happy new year to you both. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy New Year to all our listeners who can find us at jacketmediaco.com or just search Manufacturing Talk Radio on Google and you'll find us on your favorite listening platform. Thanks for being with us.